Hey, this is just a quick note about our sponsor, Pravado, the premier enterprise privacy platform, purpose-built to bridge the gap between privacy and engineering. Its privacy code scanning solution embeds privacy compliance and governance into the product development lifecycle and empowers privacy and security teams with unparalleled visibility of sensitive data flows and the insights to find and fix privacy vulnerabilities. You can leverage Provado's data flows, dynamic data mapping, privacy assessment automation, and real-time visibility of privacy issues. Enter the era of proactive privacy and transform privacy from business blocker to business enabler. To learn more, go to provado.ai. Hello, I am Deborah J. Farber. Welcome to the Shifting Privacy Left podcast, where we talk about embedding privacy by design and default into the engineering function to prevent privacy harms to humans and to prevent dystopia. Each week, we'll bring you unique discussions with global privacy technologists and innovators working at the bleeding edge of privacy research and emerging technologies, standards, business models, and ecosystems. Today, I'm delighted to welcome my next guest, Jim Nasser, CEO of Acor, to discuss privacy and using the blockchain to provide computational trust for real-time applications. I had the pleasure of collaborating with Jim several times when I joined a six-month stint as privacy strategist for Hedera, which we'll talk a little bit more about Hedera in this conversation. So I'm delighted that he agreed to join me once again for a lively geek out session where he'll tell us about the development of secure, privacy-preserving, and traceable technologies, which can be easily adopted using open protocols and usable interfaces. Hi, Jim. Welcome. Hi, Deborah. It's great to uh, speak to you again, as always. And yeah, I really look forward to this. Great. Great. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your goals with Acor? I am the CEO of Acor, as you mentioned. We are a technology company uh, with focus on building blockchain-enabled software, primarily around healthcare, but uh, certainly we see ourselves building software that could be adopted by more or less any industry. Our passion is around healthcare. You know, in some ways, I consider the technology we build with the analogy of the movement maker to a, to our clients being the watchmaker. So, you know, the, the movement, the gears that go into a watch, as example, they really are, you know, they need to be high precision. They need to be anti-fragile. Um, they need to work for a long time. You, you kind of want them to be in the machinery and just work and 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 then you build on them and, and you 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 make interesting you know interesting watches or clocks and facades and things on it so that's the way we look at a lot of our technologies by design um built to be absorbed and consumed within uh other machines and and therein certainly kind of focusing on as example uh the security and, and the privacy preservation of what we do and and making sure that our gears work as advertised so then we don't compromise the machinery of, of our clients. And then my background personally is technology profession, really by academic background and, and professional background. I've also been an entrepreneur for about 20 years or so, or maybe more, <laughs> and uh, largely in software development, um, a lot of very large-scale technologies. I've worked with the government for a long time, I worked at the government, at the CDC, as, as the chief software architect uh, for a couple of years and, and really got my hands um, kind of dirty in, in public health and building, you know, what we felt like was modern, interoperable software uh, for public health and what led to what is now called Open CDC. And the last few years, uh, very much with ACOR, uh, more or less continuing along the, the path of building Open technologies, which has really been my background over the last decade or so, but but very much, as I mentioned, with uh, blockchain technologies in mind, where it makes sense. It doesn't make sense in every case. So that's a little bit of a background. Thank you. That's really helpful. I've been really impressed with your work at the CDC, so I'm glad you mentioned that <laughs> as part of your background. You know, why did you decide to use blockchain technology and distributed ledger technology, uh, aka DLT, when building out uh, apps uh, within Acor. Yeah. So just to clarify, and I think 
I'm assuming your, your audience knows this, but blockchain really is, is one form of this larger distributed ledger technology space. And the work that we do is primarily in, in with DLT and not necessarily with, I guess, strictly defined blockchain technology. So as, as example, we're not doing work with, for instance, the Bitcoin network where you know every block is, is linked to the uh, subsequent block and there's an origin block and things like this, which is really where I think the purists would define blockchain. But that clarification aside, uh, I think really the my interest in DLT technologies I guess maybe like a lot of us started around 10 years ago or so in, in maybe 2013, 14 timeframe, just hearing about mining on, on Bitcoin and in the early days of Ethereum. But then during my CDC days, I kind of came across these use cases where really the core problem was siloed data, data that, that was relevant at the federal level or at the state level for public health purposes for instance, notifiable uh, infectious diseases that have to be reported by convention or by law, by state law or, or federal law. And because the data is siloed, the question always is, well, you know, the data they're looking at, is it accurate? Where is it? Where is the source? Can you verify the source? Is this a point of origin or is there some kind of a uh, intermediary in there? What has happened when you have transformed the data from this original source, which could, as example, be on, on fax paper, if you can believe it, even to this day, you know, circa, you know, November 2022, uh, and all these kind of questions, they're, they're really data questions. But then when you're trying to look at it at a population health level or as, as an aggregate level or, or in case of, for instance, pharmaceutical clinical research for anonymized patient data at an aggregate level, all these questions are very, very relevant because you can make a lot of bad decisions by looking at data that may be old, you know, it, 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 the, the source may not be clear and things like this. So all, all of these kind of reasons uh, led me down the path of thinking, well, is there a way for us to, to determine provenance? Is there a way for us to determine authenticity and like proving things that have happened? Like, for instance, Jim touched this piece of data and transformed it from an HL7 uh, original format to, uh, you know, like a JSON machine readable format, these kind of questions. And, and all of this kind of led me down the path of what myself and my team down a path of considering uh, blockchain technologies. At that time, Ethereum, we built our own Ethereum network for some testing and, and use test nets and things like this within the CDC. And then later on, realizing many of the inefficiencies and, and frankly, impracticalities of pulling Ethereum off for realistic, usable applications, healthcare, moving on to uh, kind of next generation technologies and, and then selling in on Hedera Hashgraph, which you, know, you mentioned a little bit earlier, which really met most of our criteria at that time. Uh, the only one it didn't meet at that time was, was that it was an open source. It was a proprietary algorithm that, that is now no longer the case, but, but certainly met our criteria in terms of, for instance, allowing us to do real-time transactions, being able to scale to meet you know, possibly hundreds or, or thousands of transactions, being cost efficient, very cost efficient for, for us to be able to do possibly um, you know, tens of thousands, maybe even millions of transactions you know, per month and not create a massive you know, cost that, that would make it impractical. All these kind of questions you know, we had. That's the origin of our kind of background and real interest in, in blockchain. And this, this concept that you mentioned, this uh, computational trust is really to differentiate that we're really looking at, can we use cryptography, public cryptography and, and public networks and, and distributed ledgers to impute trust you know, in, in an environment where you don't necessarily trust the source of information. And in many cases, perhaps all cases in, in larger contexts, you don't know them. So, so there's almost no way of trusting them. You don't have contractual agreements in place. And even if you did, you wouldn't necessarily be able to govern or control every interaction, you know, and, and, and that's a very different concept than having just trust because you can certainly argue that that does exist already and there, there are intermediaries that kind of provide that. But I think that's, that goes down a whole different kind of a path that is really not to do with computational crisis, to do with, with, you know, having organizational trust or some kind of a process operation, which is fine. I mean, it's not to say that everything that you do is, is going to be 
uh, you know, decentralized or, or computational in, in terms of this trust idea. But but certainly where we wanted to go was not to create more and more intermediaries. And I think those of you guys, I, I know you are, Deborah, but your audience familiar with healthcare, you would know that it really, really suffers from intermediaries, way, way too many intermediaries all across the board from, you know, from drug development, clinical research, you know, to healthcare patient support, price transparency or, or pricing for products and drugs and treatments to public health. I mean, you name it, global health, there's way too many intermediaries, you know, and, and they significantly degrade the, the value and, and the, the experience that you're getting. And not to mention inflate costs, not to mention, I mean, we saw with COVID, unfortunately, uh, and, and we have seen it for the last two decades in, in case of opioid and substance abuse. All of these lead to like real human loss and human death. And, and th- this is not just an economic conversation. There, there, there are real people involved. And, and all of these intermediaries are, are really a big part of the, the problem. But, but the intermediaries... You know, they, they have a cottage industry that they they do well, uh, very well. In that case, to take a case of PBMs as an example, uh, the pharmacy benefit managers, you know, there's a few big ones uh, and they, they largely control pricing for all of products. And, and you know, they, they have a real skin in the game because they, they make a lot of money on it and very much monopolize the pricing for a lot of drugs. So all to say not to kind of digress into, you know, the many issues in healthcare, but but the last thing I wanted to do was to, you know, essentially advocate and bring in another centralized intermediary and, and, and have a you know an entity, even with the best intentions, who's in the middle arbitrating transactions to prove whether, you know, for instance, a um, piece of data we're receiving around, I don't know, let, let's say COVID, you know, if that's valid or if it came from the authorized source and things like this. So that, that's that's the whole kind of background in, in a long-winded way. That's really helpful. And one of the things I, you know, I will also want to point out is that the more intermediaries you have, the more uh, you have potential for breach of personal data. So the more touch points across different organizations, um, it's just creating more attack surface even for data about individuals. So I definitely thank you for helping illustrate the challenge out there. What's been your approach then to be helpful in creating an app that is going to, or creating a set of apps that are privacy preserving that are, you know, right now I know you're focused more on the healthcare space, although they can be applied elsewhere. You know, how do you go about building decentralized applications on distributed ledger technology without creating more intermediaries? How does it help? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, loyal listeners. The Shifting Privacy Left podcast is seeking sponsors who want to help educate our growing community of privacy engineers. Position your brand in front of privacy engineers, architects, developers, researchers, and privacy tech buyers. Insert a 30 to 60 second ad like this one into every published episode of the podcast. This is dynamic content after all. Feature your new product, an upcoming conference, a sponsored special deal, endless opportunities. Email sponsorship at shiftingprivacyleft.com for more information on our sponsorship package. Okay, let's get back to our engaging privacy conversation. There is no like one singular silver bullet, right? And I think anyone who says that or intimates that, you know, is either very naive or, or quite self-serving. And I think we've seen a lot of both. So yeah. I don't want to give that impression, right? I think what we're, you know, and, and honestly, in the context of healthcare, the barriers for improvement are pretty low, right? I, I mean, it, it's so messed up. I mean, honestly, and I, and I don't want to digress and, and just get into all of the various ways it is, but but it's not the only one, right? It's not the only industry. It, it's we're seeing it really across many industries. So bottom line is, is that with just improving some elements, uh, even if we can't necessarily do everything or disintermediate, you know, the entire industry and things like this, which, you know, would be nice, but completely unpractical and, and not realistic, you know, certainly in a short time frame, we can still 
improve efficacy. We can we can certainly improve reportability. We can have more assurance that when somebody says they did or did not do a certain thing, that there's some kind of a proof using public ledgers that is privacy preserving and compliant that can back that up. So that's that was the that was the approach that we took. And as an example, I think it's this concept of it's called many different things like track and trace, verification of transaction, you know, proof of action. It's a relatively straightforward thing to do with a next generation public ledger, such as header hashgraph, which is what we typically use, right? So it's it's you essentially the, the the term we use in technology we have, we have developed, you know, we call it data stamp. So you take any kind of transaction that happens. And, and those transactions really will be happening off of the chain, right? They're, they're, they're happening in what I call the analog world, the, the real world, which is just about everything that's happening. They're really not on the chain. Other than Bitcoin, you take Bitcoin aside and, and possibly some DeFi use cases, pretty much everything else, the actual source of data is not on, on a public ledger or, or, or even a private ledger. It's, it's just, it's, you know, it's, as example, in healthcare, sitting on on public on rather uh, electronic medical record systems, right? So you can do you can use a, a DLT to do data sampling, where you take a, a transaction that has happened, and you basically at the moment it's happened, you essentially anchor it to a public ledger with an encrypted reference, you know. And and what that does is that if there is if there's an issue of any kind, for instance, uh, data leakage, uh, privacy, kind of ethical issues and compliance issues, or, or frankly, reporting to, to regulators like EU for GDPR compliance, you can go in and basically prove uh, kind of computationally and, and using, using the public ledger as reference. Your public, if you like, footprint of, of a transaction as a proof of it happening, and then whatever else that is not publicly uh, displayed and, and many things would not be obviously. So you know, certainly, you're not going to put patient information, you know, on a public ledger. Those things would be would have a corresponding reference on your conventional secure uh, databases or, or file storage, and then you can basically prove it. You can, you can prove, you know, that transactions happen, and, and you can. And the way we do this, just, just as an example, it's not the only way, but we think it's, it's a best practice is that we, at the time a transaction occurs, you know, we basically hash that transaction. So, so we create a kind of a hash version of it using uh, standard hashing algorithms that, that have been around and proven for decades. And then we record that hash in a pseudonymized way on a public ledger, perhaps with some additional metadata to help for provenance or, or searchability and things like this. And then later on, you know, if I'm one, we need to show authenticity or verification of transaction or, or you know, if we aggregate data and, and anonymize it and need to show that the, the data has been, um, it's legitimate, has not been manipulated, all any of those reasons, many other reasons, we can do so. We, we can use the, the public ledger and, and basically prove it. So, so we think that's a step in the right direction, right? You know, it, it's not, by by itself, it's not necessarily like what I would consider as, as a game changer. But what we're not talking about, again, going back to my prior comment, we are not talking about some kind of a blue moon, you know, magical thing. It, it's incremental. It's, it's it, there are steps that you got to take. So so that's one. And then, then I think you mentioned as example, you could do you could use non fungible tokens, NFTs. And I know most of us are familiar with the board ape you know, use case or, or music NFTs and things like this. And they're well and good. I mean, that, that's fine. But you can also, um, you can also use NFTs to, uh, which an NFT is really, is just a unique, indivisible global identifier on the public ledger. That's really what it is, technically speaking. You could use it to reference, for instance, a data file or a consent, or, or a JPEG, you know, a board ape, or whatever it is. That's interesting and useful. And you could, if you wanted, if it made sense, you could, you could have it on a marketplace and you could trade it and things like this, or have loyalties. But I think what's, what's more interesting, at least for a lot of our use cases in healthcare, is you can thereafter have associative transactions refer back to that NFT. So as example, if you have a consent, or if you capture the consent of a potential clinical research patient, 
from the first moment you have interaction, you, you capture it, you create an NFT. And in clinical research, especially if you go through all the phases and, and you actually participate, you know, it's likely to, to last possibly years. It's likely to go through many different consent agreements as, as you get more and more closer to, to actually being in the clinical trial and, and, and being included in it. So, so Jim, just to give the audience a little background, you're describing yeah. right now one of my favorite apps that you and Acor have created called Rights Hash, right? A decentralized right. software engine that's implemented using serverless open APIs that provides an easy means to represent and manage an individual's rights and protections as discrete, globally unique digital assets. And just to give more context, Rights Hash uses the public Hedera distributed ledger platform to associate and track an individual's digital rights, like consent to participate in a clinical trial, and they track the NFT for those consents. So so continue unpacking that for us. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's good. That's exactly it. I mean, that's <clears throat> not to be overly kind of flowery about it, but but you know, we, we just believe that there are practical tools such as this proof of action concept, such as state proofs, which is something that Hedera provides, which is like one one degree of an additional degree of, of uh, cryptographic assuredness, if you like, that that a transaction you know happened with, with a particular state, such as using non-fungible tokens in, in this context of anchoring file or, or or consent agreement or or as example, we're working with with a with a sports agency right now and and, and they're taking uh, name image likeness of, of athletes and and associating that to to what they call a declaration certificate. Uh you know and having that deck cert be an NFT, there's so many different use cases, right? So these are the kind of, these are the gears, if you like, or the movements that, that we're building and we're trying to build it as kind of scalable and, and cost-effective and anti-fragile as possible and then have our clients basically consume them and, and consume them easily and, and not worry about the ins and outs of, of how to, those gears were built, the gears being really APIs that their application programming interfaces, you know, in, in technical terms. You know, we manage that and, and they consume it easily and then they, they just build upon it. But uh, but yeah, that's it. And Rice Hash really is, is a decentralized engine. You know, it's, it's a way we refer to it. A software framework is, is, a, is a technical, more technical term about it. But it just allows us to kind of do these things, uh, do it very quickly, do it very transparently, cheaply. We have an explorer that allows us to basically, or allows our clients to see what, what is happening more or less in real time, to see the audit, auditability and traceability in real time, but very, very easy to use graphical tools that, that you know, can dice and splice in almost any which way you like. And we just really believe that all these things, ultimately the, the so what question that all these things is that we're increasing transparency and accountability in a way that does not violate either people's rights or their privacy or, or or compromise confidential information, yet, you know, it does provide a lot more or shed a lot more light on what is really happening uh, in these kind of use cases where, where that public transparency is really important. I mean, and in, in fact, we've seen it recently in, in the world of crypto where things that you would expect to be transparent operations on, on you know, exchanges as example actually be anything but transparent and be incredibly opaque and, and really in, in many ways a ponzi scheme and and you know something that really nobody had any clue about and, and so so we, we kind of believe that at least our technologies and, and the use cases that we're we're in we want to be the opposite of that we want to you know we want to kind of make it as compliant as as transparent as provable using public cryptography as possible I'd also add that you do a great job of making it usable, right? Like usable privacy. And so I have two questions regarding that, or maybe you can combine them together. But the first would be, you know, what are the benefits to this approach to decentralized data storage? You've touched on some of it, but maybe there's under that umbrella, you have some more to add. And then how do you leverage usable privacy kind of principles to make it less about compliance and more about enabling the business to respect data protection requirements and respect the human privacy rights of individuals. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, there's a lot there, Deborah, of course. Uh, <laughs> We've got time. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. So one thing to, to be clear, um, 
we are at least most of our use cases, not all of them. Some certainly this this idea of decentralized data, for instance, using um, technologies like IPFS to to actually have the, the source data or the PDF, if you like, or or whatever the JPEG, be decentralized and, and send multiple nodes. We're doing some of that, but for many of our use cases, particularly the healthcare ones, for all kinds of reasons, uh, you know, if, if for not a reason that. The health data, uh, for instance, patient health data, really by lawyer or by kind of policy of, of the software vendors, you're unable to move it. You're, you're not, and you don't really want to move it. You know, you, because there, uh, if you have your health data at a particular healthcare network, that's really the source. And, and the next time you go in there and you have a checkup, that's where the information will be captured. So, all to say, in many of our use cases, we're not actually you know, kind of decentralizing the actual, um, if you like, the binary files or or, or the health data or whatever. And, and you know, in most cases, we, like I mentioned, we don't really even want to. What we are doing is that um, when we have access to it through a private transport or, or to, to a private session, secure encrypted session, we read whatever it is that within is within the scope of what we're supposed to read. So for instance, if we're supposed to read a patient's health record synchronized since last month, so that the scope is limited to, to whatever may have happened over last month, then we, we take that information as we're reading it in this encrypted session, and we on the fly, basically in memory, create this hash or equivalence of it. And then we thereafter really we're just using the hash as a reference. So we're not we're not copying data, we're not moving it, we're not really decentralizing it. Uh you know, in most of those cases, we're just we're using this this computational reference that then anytime we want to go back and, and say, well, did this really happen? You know, did Jim and Deborah really speak on on this particular date? We can go back and, and look at the hash that was created at that time in memory. You know, and compare it to to the information that's recorded on a database, and say, do these do these match? You know, do the timestamps match, and and these kind of things, and and then so that's really kind of part of our our mentality and thinking that that encrypted reference, which is privacy preserving, that becomes our auditability and provenance trace, right? And and, and we're not moving data where we we shouldn't, you know, cannot for, for all kinds of reasons or Frankly, it's not best practice to move data. And, and as you know, every time you move data uh, from one system to another, certainly if you decentralize it, uh, you're increasing your footprint for all kinds of, of bad things that potentially happen, such as uh, you know security leaks, privacy leaks, uh, monitoring leaks, um, you know Trojan horses. I mean, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can happen when you're moving data uh, you know, around. So, so that's you know that's part of our thinking is is making sure we don't do that. Going back to your comment about usability, I think this is. Is very very core to our thinking, whether it's in context of privacy preservation or, or in general, um, for instance, having DLT as a backbone to what we do. Really, most of our users and the use cases that we have, our clients like the idea of, of having this provenance or provability, but with public transparency and and you know having computational trust and things, these kind of concepts, but. Uh, they know and we know that if if we are now you know creating additional burdens for our users, uh, for instance, physicians who are already way overburdened with what they have to do for their day job, that it will never happen. It will never be anything more than you know possibly an interesting academic proof of concept, but but something that nobody would ever implement. You know, would, would buy at least not now. So that's very much in our thinking, which is that. You know, if we are going to do all this stuff, we're going to use a public DLT and improve things. If we're going to have token economics behind the scenes, which is really one of the key kind of concepts behind public DLTs, is this idea of tokenization and, and is used for security and, and kind of value creation, attribution, and all kinds of things like this. But none of this really it needs to be surfaced unless our client actually wants it. It doesn't need to be surface at the application level. It really should work as plumbing. You know, I have a picture that I often, you know, kind of speak about at conferences where, where, where literally I talk about blockchain and DLT and, and the software we build, you know, as, as a piping that's underneath the application, like the healthcare applications we're building or a public health reporting we're building, 
that is really the like if you like the kitchen or the shower facade and 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 you know and, and when, when you're a user all you really care about is you know is the hot water coming is, is the pressure good is it a nice clean place for me to you know, take a shower you, you could care less you know what the piping looks underneath the tiles and, and certainly not going to dig the tiles up you know to, to look at the pipes and, and you know measure the gauge on the pipes and things like that you kind of trust that you know if the guys building this or the gals building this are doing their job correctly and they know what they're doing, that they're doing it correctly because your experience is measured by the, the water coming in, the water pressure and, and the experience you're having and you know, taking a shower, not not about what you know what's going on underneath the tiles in the kitchen. So that's that's our mentality. It's very much just I get abstracting what we're doing. So, so the usability of of our apps and the privacy preservation and computational trust, all these things are really behind the scenes. If and when our clients want to, and, and we practically do this, want to see the proof. So it's not just taking my word for it, it's available in real time. But for most of them, when they see like, for instance, a verified green check button that just appears in real time, they realize that that, that is an assurance that, that these uh, kind of DLT concepts and things that we're talking about are really working. And, and if they wanted to see the proof, they can click on it. They can drill down. You know, it's, it's all built in proactively. We do this kind of privacy preserved transaction surfacing really proactively. It's, it's built in, but you don't have to take extra steps every single time to, to prove something happened unless you really want to. That's our mentality is, is to abstract that stuff. And then, then really our focus then is, and this is one of the reasons, one of several reasons why we like it, our hash graph is, well, if you're doing, as example, a patient, um, one of our, our startup clients is, is doing patient recruitment for uh, for what is called orphan drug development, which is drug development that's that's novel and, and you know, and for instance, for rare liver cancer, as an example, it's, it's a real example. So in, in that scenario, and if, if a patient or potential patient is interacting with, uh, with an app, you know, that they download from the app store, you know, they could care less about what, what blockchain is there or whether there is blockchain or token economics and any of that. They care about, you know, how easy is it for them to sign up? How easy is it for them to get their health record to synchronize, to find potential clinical trial, to be, to have a simple consent process to, to then get into the next step of potentially being included in trial and things like this. And from a researcher perspective, they also care about the ability for underserved patients being able to have accessibility, you know, to, to, to their trials and information and not get hung up on some, you know, exotic blockchain technology somebody's built. So that's really very much a thinking that we have is do it, do it behind the scenes and, and but, but be provable in real time proactively. So, so you don't have to, there's not a need for a discovery process, right? We don't want to, the last thing we want to do is, is to do these things. And then if somebody says, prove it, you know, that we need to do a, like a six month, you know, e-discovery project and cost millions of dollars, uh, right? So that's, that's not what we're talking about. But that's that's, that's our approach. It's, it's very much build it in, but, but build it behind the scenes and make it part of plumbing. Well, that was really helpful. There's two things I want to kind of call out from what you've said. You were referring to how rights hash works and that you use a hash as a reference to personal data. And I just want to make it clear to everyone out there that the best practice is don't ever put personal data, protected health data, PII, you know, any identifiable data on the blockchain or hash graph. That's the general rule. So how do you architect? So you got to think about basically architecting for data minimization. How are you going to use these tools to reference data as opposed to, you know, via a hash, as opposed to, you know, actually storing data on the blockchain. And, and a real reason for that is, you know, there are, I mean, there's so many reasons, but one of them is that, you know, it stays there forever. And there is a, you know, right to, in certain instances for, People request their data be deleted, and you can't do that if it's on an immutable uh, distributed ledger. So you got to think in terms of infrastructure and you know architecture and build. You know how are you going to build these apps and really make your app usable? And then the second thing that you mentioned is you know how you've developed Rights Hash as more of a decentralized plumbing that sits beneath applications, and that you make it so usable in that you don't you just you just get the answers to your question like. 
what is the current status of consents across the organization? Boom, there's your current status. You know what I mean? You, it, it, It's just a automated, continuous, trans, transparent auditing capability of, you know, of all the related compliance transactions, right? Like that to me is just mind-blowingly amazing that you don't even have to do manual audits anymore. You have just instant transparent auditing that anyone who is accessing the public chain can see. So, and, you know, just love the, also the ability to track and monitor discrete rights and protections in real time. So I guess to dovetail into the next topic, that would, you know, a major data protection principle of the GDPR is the accountability principle, which requires organizations to demonstrate that privacy and data protection compliance, that demonstrate that compliance. And in particular, organizations are accountable for first maintaining record keeping requirements like ROPAs or records of processing activities. You need to, you're accountable for the security of personal data. So making sure you have to prove that you're enforcing privacy rules through your security controls and, and, and approaches. And then uh, third, you kind of need certain privacy assurances to demonstrate that you're actually doing what you say you're doing. And it kind of appears that rights hash maps really well to these accountability needs. You mentioned this before, but is there any more that you want to mention around accountability and how you've built rights hash to meet the accountability principle? Yeah, I mean, what I would say, Deborah, is, is you know, going back to this metaphor of the plumbing, rights hash and, and the way we have developed it and continue to extend it really would be consumed as part of uh, a specific application that then would have contextual accountability and contextual like flow and contextual data kind of monitoring or, or protection or rights protection um, simulations. So I give, I give you, a, I, I, and I've mentioned it several times, but uh, this was our, our kind of, if you like, our genesis use case and, and the one that we've spent most amount of time with so we want to work clients and partners called the Fiduciary Data Corporation, FTC. So it's been really all around this, this idea of, it started with, with the idea of consent and not just for kind of like a research the, the, with the healthcare background and pharma background. That was that was our initial you know, kind of uh, departure. But but really since then, we have, and, and again, working with, with this uh, client, uh, Fiduciary Data, really is kind of evolved into this larger context of basically um, in simple terms, FDC, this fiduciary data corporation, being really like a bank for digital assets. That's the way I think they describe themselves. But but it's really this, this idea that like in the real world, in, in an analog world, as example, you know, you, to do more or less any financial transaction of, of any real substance. You know, you, you're going to have lawyers, you're going to have accountants, you're going to have notaries, perhaps, financial advisors, if I can get it out. Uh, you're going to have, and this is something I've, I've come across myself personally, uh, power of attorney and, and representation, things like this. All these things are kind of there, and they're really, in some ways, in an analog world. They're there to help you remain compliant. They're there to help you navigate a uh, regulatory kind of needs, whether it's reporting or or KYC or IML, there's all kinds of other, you know, kind of regulatory needs and, and compliances that they have to meet. But then they're also really there to help you with the usability of the overall process, right? As example, you know, if, if you don't have a power of attorney in an analog world, you know, many things would just break down, right? You know, you, your people get, get old, you know, there's... Um, you know that you could have uh, physical condition issues or, or mental issues. There's all kinds of reasons why you need to have that. And and whereas when you think about it in context of, for instance, cryptocurrencies or or like NFTs representing rare images or or athletes dunking you know basketball or whatever it happens to be, the equivalent doesn't really exist, right? It's not there. It's not th those custodial type services that do exist and really need to exist in the analog world don't exist, you know, in, in the blockchain space right now. And that's a real issue because there's there's a lot of money that's 
potentially a lot of value that's associated to those digital assets. So going going back to like where where what where does Rice Hash fit into this and, and what is the accountability that it provides is really to to basically provide, like I mentioned, the plumbing for, for a company like fiduciary data or, or um you know another one of our clients, Re Private, uh, who's working with athletes and protecting their rights, to be able to build the contextual flow, the contextual compliance, the business rules, the, the, the logic, the, the flow for what it takes to, to provide rights management or, or custodial services or consent, you know, consent to do anything, all those things in their applications. But then behind the scenes, you know, rice hash or our technologies are being used you know, in general, our hash log and rice hash technologies are being used to essentially anchor things to a public ledger or use NFTs as, as a means of, of referencing these assets on a ledger in an encrypted way or privacy preserving way and so on and so forth. So that's that's the way it kind of works out in, in reality is, is, you know, our software framework absorbed pretty easily you know, as, as software as a service through APIs by, by these companies and, and their, their products. But then those companies and products really are contextual. It's not a generic you know, and you know, this of course, you know, privacy, you know, it's and and, and kind of being accountable. So it's so GDPR, like protecting GDPR rights, like access and and you know, being able to be informed and you know, rectify things, erase things, etc. Those are all contextual. It's contextual to what you're doing. It's not a generic, you know, you can't just build something generically and say, you know, here it is, it works for everything. So I think that that's that's really kind of what we try to do is, is make sure our gears work and then we work with our clients to to kind of configure those gears correctly within their applications. So then the net result is that, that they do get that contiguous, you know, auditing and, and the, the, the contiguous kind of hashing of transactions or, or, or the audit trails or whatever it happens to be that that's relevant consent, uh, NFTs for, you know, for image rights, you name it. Great. I really appreciate that answer. So your first deployment for rights hash was really largely focused on healthcare clinical trials. And you're also building uh, the, the next iteration of rights hash, which you call consent hash and describe as a fully functional blockchain enabled consent platform based on rights hash. Where else do you anticipate use cases or see opportunities for this technology? And tell us a little bit about how the, the platform is going to differ from rights hash. Yes. Yeah, so so um, I, I think this is actually a good example of you and I, we haven't spoken for a little while. <laughs> so it's a little bit of an evolution, if you like, uh, Deborah, of, of kind of where we were uh, in terms of Rice Hash as, as this framework and engine, uh, and then building our own specific instantiations, such as Consent Hash, versus where we're at right now, which is that really Consent Hash, if you like, is, is just a consent use case. And it's largely being, right now anyways, is absorbed by several clients, such as fiduciary data, and we, we have consent same kind of context, uh, or rather concept, but for a different client. So just not just a healthcare use case. It's exactly. Like so it's, it's, case it's much consent. more towards the the kind of going down the, the the gears that are being consumed. And then, honestly, for us, I think we just see you know a lot more use cases across multiple. Certainly within healthcare, multiple use cases, but also within different verticals, and, and certainly on privacy type solutions. So so we've kind of moved away from, I guess, labeling or naming specific use cases as another product, which would have been, so consent hash was, was really just an instantiation of consent, the consent use case for, well, you know, for, for the rice hash framework. So now basically we just keep it to rice hash, you know, less marketing stuff for us to do, less confusing for our clients, we think. And we just really work with them to consume the technologies without being hung up on like, you know, is it called this, is it called that? And, and, and like I mentioned, since we see these really being gears and, and we are the gear maker to you, the machine maker, you know, we, we don't, you know, we don't really see the need, at least at this time, you know, may change, you never know. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't see the need to like create the full machine ourselves because it's very contextual, right? And I'm, I'm building a machine that they think, I mean, even as example, not that we're doing this, but, but if we take, for instance, uh, informed consent for clinical trials, there's all kinds of additional compliance needed to be in compliance for e-consent, right? Informed consent. It's more than just capturing consent. It's more than just anchoring it. There's all kinds of like 
checks and balances that you have to have that really, I mean, it, in, in some ways it kind of meets the regulatory checklist, if you like, but there, there are plenty of companies that are doing that already, right? So, so we don't need to be another company doing informed consent. What we can be is to say, look, you can use your informed consent tool of choice. You've already got a legacy of, of users and, and use ca- or, um, data on it, but, but use RiceHash to do this additional data anchoring, you know, simply, cheaply on a public ledger. So, so we see it as, as complementary as opposed to, you know, some, something that you're going to you know, rip and replace with our technology. Thank you for that. And I guess our, um, my last question for this conversation, and we're going to do a part two as well, which will come out the following week. But how can companies like Acor, who's building technology based on distributed ledger technology, you know, plan to get adoption? You know, what are what are the steps that you recommend that or that you think will gain adoption for technology like this? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a very insightful question. It's, it's one that I don't think there is a very easy answer for. There is a, and you know, this, Deborah, of course, you and I have both been, you know, kind of in the Hedera space and the DLT space for a number of years, but there, there's definitely, I think, a commitment that people like us, you know, who've been around for a while and have built technologies that are, I think, credible production already in production with, with a number of use cases and clients, there is a need for commitment to keep going because it is kind of swimming upstream low, but it's, uh, right now it is, I think maybe in our second conversation, we'll talk about some of, uh, some of the noise and some of the, well, certainly I, I think all of us have experienced the, 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 the downturn in the crypto space uh, this year, but, but those are things that dissuade, you know, the, the general enterprise or, or, you know, kind of um, more conservative companies out there, or frankly, the non-DeFi use cases to kind of go ahead or go ahead that quickly. So I think we kind of have to make that commitment. I think so part of the adoption, I think there's this, there's a there's a more, I would say holistic big picture commitment to to really driving and educating on why DLT, like the so what question, right? And, and it's not a so what a core question. It's a so what DLT question. And then after that, the next layer is so what uh, Hedera, because that's what we use, and, and for the reasons that you know I've described, and then then the next, like if you like the you've heard of the five no's of getting things done, we're kind of like we're like the third or fourth no, right? You know why? why then the next one we would we, be like why healthcare, then why acorn. So, but unless you kind of think like that, I think you're gonna you know you're gonna miss the bigger point that you know a lot of people just don't they're hung up on the first you know on the first uh line of logic right you know uh and i think you just have to have that kind of nuance and think through it so i think that commitment is really really important i think the next thing though and, and this is something that, that we definitely can affect more directly right you know is, is really working and, and you know you have to find some clients uh and some use cases that that echo uh other clients that, that are already forward looking and, and and want to be part of this at least in healthcare part of this this championing of better results, you know, more, more efficacy, lower costs, things like this. And then there's a few who really want to do it and, and are not just grandstanding about it, which is the many. Um, so, so work with them, find them, work with them, make a case with them and prove to them that what you can do is doable and it's doable in a way that's practical. I think, you know, I, I often talk about this, being practical is, is hugely important for a company like Acor because th- there's a lot of like, really interesting, fancy, exotic things we can do uh, that perhaps no client would ever pay for I mean, or would buy because they just, they don't see the value or it's just too expensive or it's too much of an edge case at this time. And so therefore it's not practical, right? And, and so a company like Acor just wouldn't be in business if that's what we're pursuing. Um, so I think that's part of the adoption is, is do that. And then the other part of it really honestly is, is um, you kind of have to, get get some products and, and this is really part of the the risk reward for an entrepreneur right and, and i would say rice is a very good example of this deborah because we we took that on took an idea with, with a potential startup client and really spent a lot of our our own time and money and commitment to build it out 
and just trying to kind of take what, what was what seemed like a like a problem um and uh you know and, and really kind of build it and, and build it in a good way and, and then say all right can we now help drive some some use cases it's not really i don't think it's, it's kind of a build it and they will come type of thing because i don't think we're at that kind of you know macro adoption stage with with dlt but if you can be a little bit more targeted and have at least one or two clients that you're working with collaborating with as you're building this i think you can build yourself a little bit of a runway a little bit of credibility hopefully some revenue that comes even if it's modest because those are the things that then you know when you flip the page become the the pillars that you're building the next level on and and, and then the bigger clients the bigger use cases the, the higher um transactions per second and, and all these kind of things so, so that's that's really what we've tried to do i think we've you know, it's certainly not like a kind of a foolproof model. I'm not suggesting it is. I, I think there's there's other ways of doing it. And, you know, we could possibly get somebody like uh, Andreessen Harvest to give you $100 million that, that may accelerate the, the planning. But, but you know, we're not at that stage, or at least we haven't pursued that at this time. But but that's kind of, you know, that, that's a practical approach we're taking. Well, I would hope you'd go with an organization that does better due diligence. But that's just my opinion <laughs> <laughs> on VCs. Thank you so much for joining us today on Shifting Privacy Left. We're going to continue our conversation for next week's episode. So until next Tuesday, everyone, we'll be back next week with the second half of my conversation with Jim Nasser about privacy and using DLT. We'll discuss privacy at Hedera and also chat about recent issues ripped from the headlines. Stay tuned and join us next week. Thanks for joining us this week on Shifting Privacy Left. Make sure to visit our website, shiftingprivacyleft.com, where you can subscribe to updates so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found this episode valuable, go ahead and share it with a friend. And if you're an engineer who cares passionately about privacy, check out Privato, the developer-friendly privacy platform and sponsor of this show. To learn more, go to privato.ai. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday for a new episode. Bye for now.